This is the BBC Home Service. We present Richard Burton and John Neville in Henry at Agincourt, a sequence from William Shakespeare's Henry V devised for broadcasting on the eve of St. George's Day. entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army's stilly sounds, that the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire. Through their paley flames, each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed in high and boastful nays, piercing the night's dull ear. And from the tents, the armourers accomplishing the nights, with busy hammers closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and over-lusty French do the low-rated English play at dice, and chide the crippled, tardy-gated knight, who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. The poor condemned English, like sacrifices, by their watchful fires sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger. And their gesture sad, investing lank, lean cheeks and war-worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon so many horrid ghosts. Oh, now, who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent? Let him cry praise and glory on his head, for forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor does he dedicate one jot of colour unto the weary and all-watched night, but freshly looks, and overbears a taint, with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty, that every wretch, pining and pale before, beholding him, pluck comfort from his looks. A largest universal like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to everyone, thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of Harry in the night. And so our scene must to the battle fly, where, oh, for pity, we shall much disgrace with four or five most vile and ragged foils, right ill-disposed in brawl ridiculous, the name of Agincourt. Yet sit and see, minding true things by what their mockeries be. Philippe, it is true that we are in great danger, the greater therefore should our courage be. Good morrow, Brother Bedford. Good morrow, my age. God Almighty, there is some soul of goodness in things evil would men observingly distill it out. For our bad neighbor makes us early stirrers, which is both healthful and good husbandry. <laughs> good morrow, old Sir Thomas Irvington. Good morrow, my age. A good soft pillow for that good white head were better than the churlish turf of France. Not so, my liege. This lodging liked me better. Since I may say, now lie I like a king. <laughs> <laughs> Lend me thy cloak, Sir Thomas. 
Brothers both, commend me to the princes in our camp. Do my good morrow to them, and anon desire them all to my pavilion. We shall, my lady. Shall I attend, Your Grace? No, my good knight. Go with my brothers to my lords of England. I and my bosom must debate a while. And then I would no other company. The Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Harry. God of mercy, old heart. Thou speakst cheerfully. Captain Fluellen! Who comes here? I will withdraw and mark. Captain Fluellen! So, in the name of Jesus Christ, speak lower. It is the greatest admiration in the universal world when the true and ancient prerogatives and laws of the wars is not kept. Well, Captain, if I... you would take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, I warrant you shall find there is no tittle tattle or people babble in Pompey's camp. Why, the enemy is loud. You heard him all night. If the enemy is an ass and a fool and a plating coxcomb, is it me, think you, that we shall also look you be an ass and a fool and a plating coxcomb? In your own conscience now. <sighs> I will speak lower. I pray you and beseech you that you will. Though it appear a little out of fashion, there is much care and valour in this Welshman. Brother John Bates, is not that the morning which breaks yonder? Uh, I think it be. We have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of the day. But I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under uh, Sir Thomas Irvingham. Ah. A good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand that look to be washed off the next tide. Ah. He hath not told his thought to the king. No. Nor did he not meet he should. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me, the element shows to him as it doth to me, all his senses have but human conditions, his ceremonies laid by, and his nakedness he appears but a man. Though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop with a like wing. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are, yet in reason no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he, by showing it, should dishearten his army. Uh, he may show what outward courage he will, but I believe as cold a night as tis, he could wish himself in Thames up to the neck. And so I would he were, and I'd buy him at all adventures, so we were quit here. <laughs> by my troth, I would speak my conscience of the king. I do not think he would wish himself anywhere but where he is. And I would he were here alone, so should he be sure to be ransomed, and a many poor men's lives saved. I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here. Alone. Howsoever you speak this to feel other men's minds. Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company, his cause being just and his quarrel honorable. That's more than we know. Aye, or more than we should seek after. Aye. For we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If these cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good... The king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. Aye. When all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in a battle shall join together at the latter day and cry all, we died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon the children rawly left. Aye. I'm afeard there are few die well that die in a battle. Now, if these men do not die well, it'll be a black matter for the king that led them to it. Aye. So, if a son that is by his father sent about merchandise do sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon the father that sent him. Or if a servant, under his master's command, transporting a sum of money, be assailed by robbers and die in many irreconciled iniquities, you may call the business of the master the author of the servant's damnation. But this is not so. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, the father of his son, nor the master of his servant. For they purpose not their deaths, when they purpose their services. Besides, there is no king be his cause never so spotless if it come to the arbitrament of swords, 
can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. Or some peradventure happen in the guilt of premeditated and contrived murder, some of beguiling virgins with the broken seals of perjury, some making the wars their bullock that have before gored the gentle bosom of peace with pillage and robbery. Now, if these men have defeated the law and outrun native punishment, though they can outstrip men, they have no wings to fly from God. War is his beadle. War is his vengeance. So that here men are punished for before breach of the king's laws, in now the king's quarrel, where they fear the death they have borne life away, and where they would be safe, they perish. Then if they die unprovided, no more is the king guilty of their damnation than he was before guilty of those impieties for which they are now visited. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Therefore should every soldier in the wars do as every sick man in his bed wash every moat out of his conscience, and dying so, death were to him advantage, or not dying, the time was blessedly lost wherein such preparation was gained. And in him that escapes, it were not seem to think that, making God so free an offer, he let him outlive that day to see his greatness and to teach others how they should prepare. Mm -hmm. It is certain. Every man that dies ill, the ill is upon his own head. The king's not to answer for it. I do not desire he should answer for me, and yet I determined to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. <laughs> I said so, to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, and we ne'er the wiser. If ever I live to see it, I will never trust his word after. You <laughs> pay him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a pearl of shot out of an elder gun that a poor and a private displeasure can do against a monarch. You may as well go about to, to turn the sun to ice with Fannin in his face with, with a peacock's feather. <laughs> You'll never trust his word after. Count is a foolish thing. Your proof is something too round. I shall be angry with you at the time of convenience. Hmm? Well, let it be a quarrel between us, if you live. I embrace it. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gauge of thine, and I will wear it in my bonnet. Then if ever thou darest acknowledge it, I will make it my quarrel. Hmm. Here's my glove. Give me another of thine. There. This will I also wear in my cap. If ever thou come to me and say after tomorrow, This is my glove, by this hand I'll take thee a box on the ear. If ever I live to see it, I will challenge it. Thou durst as well be hanged. Well, I will do it, so I take me in a king's company. Well, keep thy word. Fare thee well. Ah, be friends, you English fools. Be friends. We have French quarrels enough. Fare thee well. Upon the king. Let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. Oh, hard condition. Twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool whose sense no more can feel but his own ringing. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And what have kings that privates have not to save ceremony, save general ceremony? And what art thou, thou idle ceremony? What kind of God art thou that suffers more of mortal griefs than do thy worshippers? What are thy rents? What are thy comings in? O oh, ceremony, show me but thy worth. What is thy soul of adoration? Art thou aught else but place, degree, and form, creating awe and fear in other men, wherein thou art less happy being feared than they in fearing? What drinks thou oft instead of homage sweet, but poisoned flattery? Oh, be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Thinks thou the fiery fever will go out with titles blown from adulation? 
Will it give place to flexure and low bending? Canst thou in our commands the beggar's knee command the health of it? No, thou proud dream that placed so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know it is not the balm, the scepter, and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown, imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, the farcid title running for the king, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony. Not all these, laid in bed majestical, can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave, who with a body filled and vacant mind gets him to rest crammed with distressful bread. Never sees horrid night, the child of hell. But like a lackey from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus and all night, Sleeps in Elysium. Next day after dawn doth rise and help I peer into his horse and follow so the ever running year with profitable labour to his grave. And but the ceremony, such a wretch winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand advantage of a king. The slave. A member of the country's peace enjoys it. But in gross brain, little what's, what watch the king keeps to maintain the peace whose hours the peasant best advantages. My lord, hmm? your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek through your camp to find you. Good old knight. Collect them all together at my tent. I'll be before thee. I shall do it, my lord. O oh God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts, possess them not with fear, take from them now the sense of reckoning, unless the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. Not today, O oh Lord, O oh not today, think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. I, Richard's body, have interred new, and on it have bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forced drops of blood. Five hundred poor of I in yearly pay, who twice a day their withered hands hold up towards heaven to pardon blood. And I have built two chantries, where the sad and solemn priest sings still for Richard's soul. More will I do. Though all that I can do is all too little, since that my penitence comes after all, imploring pardon. My brother Gloucester's voice. Stay, Gloucester. Stay, and I will go with thee. The day, my friends, and all things, stay for me. The king himself is rode to view their battle. Of fighting men, they have pulled three score thousand. There are five to one. Besides, they all are fresh. Oh, God's arms strike with us. It is a fearful odds. God be with you, princes all. I'll to my charge. If we no more meet till we meet in heaven, then joyfully, my noble lord of Bedford, my dear lord Gloucester, and my good lord Exeter, and my kind kinsmen, warriors all, adieu. Farewell, good Salisbury, and good luck go with thee. Farewell, kind lord. Fight valiant here today. And yet, I do thee wrong to mind thee of it, for thou art framed of the firm truth of valour. He is as full of valour as of kindness, princely in both. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes, sir? My Your Majesty. Majesty. Ah, my cousin Westmoreland. No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires. 
But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No, faith, my cousin. Wish not a man from England. God's peace! I would not lose so great an honor as one man more, methinks, would share with me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his person. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages <laughs> what deeds he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, our bed, shall think themselves a curse they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap, while then he speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. My sovereign lord, restore yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedients charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Perish the man whose mind is backward now. Thou dost not wish more help from England, Carl? God's will, my liege, but you and I alone, without more help, might fight this battle. Out. Why, now thou hast unwished five thousand men, which likes me better than to wish us one. <laughs> there comes the herald of the French, my lord. Once more I come to know of thee, King Harry. If for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow. For certainly thou art so near the gulf, thou needs must be unglutted. Besides, in mercy, the constable desires thee thou wilt mind thy followers of repentance, that their souls may make a peaceful and a sweet retire from off these fields, where wretches, their poor bodies must lie and fester. Who hath sent thee now? The constable of France. I pray thee, bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me, and then sell my bones. Good God, why should they mock poor fellows thus? The man that once did sell the lion skin while the beast lived was killed with hunting him. <laughs> Many of our bodies shall no doubt find native graves, upon the which I trust shall witness within brass of this day's work. And those that leave their valiant bones in France dying like men, though buried in your dung hills, they shall be famed, for there the sun shall greet them and draw their honors reeking up to heaven, leaving their earthly past to choke your climb, the smell whereof shall breed a plague in France. Tell the constable... We are but warriors for the working day. Our gainers and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field. There's not a piece of feather in our host. Good argument. I hope we will not fly. <laughs> and time hath worn us into slovenry. But by the mass, our hearts are in the trim, and my poor soldiers tell me yet ere night they'll be in fresher robes, or they will pluck the gay new coats through the French soldiers' ears and turn them out of service. If they do this as if God please, they shall. My ransom then will soon be levied. Herald, save thou thy labor. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle herald. They shall have none, I swear, but these my bones, which if they have as I will leave them, shall yield them little.
tell the constable. I shall, King Harry. And so fare thee well. Thou never shalt hear, Harold, any more. My lord, most humbly on my knee, I beg the leading of the vanward. Take it, brave York. Now, soldiers, march away. And how thou pleasest, God, dispose the day. Forward! Christ, valiant countrymen, but all's not done. Yet keep the French the field. The Duke of York commends him to your majesty. Ah, lives he, good uncle. Thrice within this hour I saw him down. Thrice up again and fighting from helmet to the spur, all blood he was. In which array, brave soldier, doth he lie larding the plain? And by his bloody side, yoke fellow to his honor owing wounds, the noble Earl of Suffolk also lies. Ah. Suffolk first died. And York, all haggled over, comes to him where in gore he lay in steeped, and takes him by the beard, kisses the gashes that bloodily did yawn upon his face, and cries aloud, Tarry, dear cousin Suffolk, my soul shall thine keep company to heaven. Tarry, sweet soul for mine, then fly abreast as in this glorious and well fortin field we kept together in our chivalry. Upon these words I came and cheered him up. He smiled me in the face, wrought me his hand, and with a feeble grip says, Dear my lord, commend my service to my sovereign. So did he turn, and over Suffolk's neck he threw his wounded arm and kissed his lips. And so, espoused to death, with blood he sealed a testament of noble ending love. The pretty and sweet manner of it forced those waters from me which I would have stopped, but I had not so much of a man in me. And all my mother came into mine eyes and gave me up to tears. I blame you not. For hearing this, I must perforce compound with mistful eyes. Or they will issue too. But hark! What new alarm is this thing? The French have reinforced their scattered men. Give the word through! Kill the boys at the luggage goer. Tis expressly against the law of arms. Tis as arrant a piece of knavery, Mark, you know, as can be offered. In your conscience now, is it not? It is certain there's not a boy left alive, and the cowardly rascals that run from the battle have done this slaughter. Besides, they have burned and carried away all that was in the king's tent, wherefore the king, most worthily, hath caused every soldier to cut his prisoner's throat. Oh, tis a gallant king! Aye! He was born at Monmouth, Captain Gower. Ah. What call you the town's name where Alexander the Pig was born? Alexander the Great. Why, I pray you, is not Pig great? Oh, the but... Pig or the Great or the Mighty or the Huge or the Magnanimous are all one reckonings, save the phrases, little variations. I think Alexander the Great was born in Macedon. His father was called Philip of Macedon, as I take it. Ah, I think it is Macedon where Alexander is born. I tell you, Captain, if you look in the maps of the world... I warrant you shall find in the comparisons between Macedon and Monmouth that the situations look you as both alike. Oh. There's a river in Macedon, mm. and there is also, moreover, a river at Monmouth. <laughs> it is called Wye at Monmouth, but it's out of my brains what is the name of the other river. But it's all one, tis as alike as my fingers is to my fingers, mm. and there is salmons in both. If you mark Alexander's life well, Harry of Monmouth's life is come after it indifferent well. For there is figures in all things. 
Alexander, God knows, and you know, in his rages and his furies and his wraths and his collars and his moods and his displeasures and his indignations, and also being a little intoxicated in his brains, did in his ails and his angers, look, you kill his best friend, Clytus. Our king is not like him in that. He never killed any of his friends. It is not well done, Mark, you know, to take the tales out of my mouth ere it is made and finished. But, uh, I speak but in the figures and comparisons of it. As Alexander killed his friend Clytus, being in his ale and his cups, so also Harry Monmouth, being in his right wits and his good judgments, turned away the fat knight with the great belly doublet. Uh, he was full of jests and jibes and knaveries and mocks. I forgot his name. Sir John Falstaff. That is he. I tell you, there is good men born at Monmouth. Here comes his majesty. My lord. My lord, I... I was not angry since I came to France. Until this instant. Take a trumpet, Herald. Ride thou under the horsemen on yon hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come down. Or void the field. They do offend our sight. Besides, we'll cut the throats of those we have. And not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. Go and tell them so. Your Majesty. Here comes the herald of the Frenchman. Huh. His eyes are humbler than they used to be. How now? What means this, Herald? Knowst thou not that we have fined these bones of ours for ransom? Comes thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license. That we may wander o'er this bloody field. To book our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men. For many of our princes, all the while, lie drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. So do our vulgar drench their peasant limbs in blood of princes. And their wounded steeds fret fetlock deep in gore, and with wild rage yuck out their armed heels of their dead masters killing them twice. Oh, give us leave, great king, to view the field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee, truly, Herald, I know not if the day be ours or no, for yet a many of your horsemen peer and gallop o'er the field. The day is yours. The day is ours. The day is ours. Praise be God, and not our strength for it. What is this castle called that stands hard by? They call it Agincourt. Then call we this the field of Agincourt, fought on the day of Crispin. Crispianus. Your Majesty. Hmm? Your grandfather of famous memory, and please, Your Majesty, and your great uncle, Edward the Black Prince of Wales, as I have read in the Chronicles, fought the most brave battle here in France. He did, through heaven. Your Majesty says very true. Your Majesty is remembered of it. The Welshmen did good service in a garden where leeks did grow, wearing leeks in their Monmouth caps. Which your majesty know to this hour is an honourable badge of the service. And I do believe your majesty takes no scorn to wear the leak upon Sir David's day. I wear it for a memorable honour. For I am Welsh, you know, good countryman. All the water and why cannot wash your majesty's Welsh blood out of your body. I can tell you that. God bless it and preserve it as long as it pleases grace. And his majesty too. Thanks, good my countryman. By you. I am your majesty's countryman. <laughs> I care not who knows it. <laughs> I will confess it to all the world. I need not to be ashamed of your majesty, praise be God. So long as your majesty is an honest man. God keep me, sir. Our herald, go with Montjoy. Bring me just notice of the numbers dead 
on both our parts. Your Majesty. Call yonder fellow hither. Soldier, you must come to the king. Soldier, why wears thou that glove in thy cap? And please, your majesty, tis the gauge of one that I should fight withal, if he be alive. An Englishman? And please, your majesty, a rascal that swaggered with me last night, who, if alive and ever dared to challenge this glove, I have swore to take him a box of the ear. Or if I can see my glove in his cap, which he swore as he was a soldier he would wear if alive... I'll strike it out soundly. What think you, Captain Flewellyn? Is it meet this soldier keep his oath? He's a craven and a villain, else than please your majesty in my conscience. Mm. Then keep thy vows, sir, when thou meetest the fellow. So I will, my liege, as I live. Who serves thou under? Under Captain Gower, my liege. Gower is a good captain, and his good knowledge and literature in the wars. Call him hither to me, soldier. I will, my liege. Captain Flewellyn. Uh, your majesty. Take thou this glove and stick it in thy cap. If any man challenge it, he is an enemy to our person. Apprehend him, and thou dost me love. Your grace does me as great honors as can be desired in the hearts of his subjects. Knowest thou Gower? He's my dear friend, and please you. Pray thee, go seek him and bring him to my tent. I will fetch him. My lord of Warwick, my brother Gloucester. Release. Follow Flewellyn closely at the heels. The glove which I have given him for a favor may happily purchase him a box of the ears. <laughs> it is the soldiers. I, by bargain, should wear it myself. Follow good cousin Warwick. If that the soldiers strike him, as I judge by his blunt bearing, he will keep his word. Some sudden mischief may arise of it. For I do know Flewellyn valiant and touched with collar, hot as gunpowder, and quickly will return an injury. Follow and see there be no harm between them. Go you with me, Uncle of Exeter. I warrant it is to knight you, Captain. Ah. <laughs> All's will and his pleasure, Captain Gower. Yeah. I beseech you now, come a pace to the king. There is more good towards you per adventure than is in your knowledge to dream of. Sir, hmm? know you this glove in my cap? Hmm? Know the glove? I know the glove is a glove. I know this. And thus I challenge it. An arrant traitor as any is in the universal world, or in France, or in England. How now, sir, you villain? Do you think I'll be for sworn? Stand away, Captain Gower. I will give treason his payment into blows, I warrant you. I am no traitor. That's a lie in thy throat. I charge you in his majesty's name, apprehend him. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. What's the matter? My lord of Gloucester, here is, praise to God for it, a most contagious treason come to light, look you, as you shall desire in a summer's day. Here is his majesty. Ah, oh, now? What's the matter? Uh, my liege, here is a villain and a traitor, and look, Your Grace, has struck the glove which Your Majesty has given me. My liege, this was my glove. Here is the fellow of it. And he that I gave it to in change promised to wear it in his cap. I promised to strike him if he did. Uh, I, I met this man with my glove in his cap, and I've been as good as my word. Oh, Your Majesty, you know... Saving your majesty's manhood, what an arrant, rascally, beggarly, lousy name it is. Well, I hope your majesty has bear me testimony and witness and will have outment that this is the glove your majesty has given me in your conscience now. Soldier, give me that glove. Sir. Look, here is the fellow of it. Twas I indeed thou promised to strike, and thou hast given me most bitter terms. And please, Your Majesty, let his neck answer for it, if there be any martial law in the world. How canst thou make me satisfaction? Uh, all offences, my lord, come from the heart. Never came any from mine that might offend Your Majesty. It was ourself that it abused. Your Majesty came not like yourself. You appeared to me but as a common man. Witness the night, your garments, your lowliness. And what Your Highness suffered under that shape, I beseech you to take it for your own fault and not mine. Oh. For had you been as I took you for, I made no offence. Therefore, I beseech your highness, pardon me. Uncle of Exeter. My lord. Fill this glove with crowns and give it to the fellow. Keep it, fellow, and wear it for an honour in thy cap till I do challenge it. Give him the crowns. There you are, fellow. My liege. And captain... You must needs be friends with him. By this day and this light, the fellow has metal enough in his belly. Hold. 
There is twelve pence for you. <laughs> and I pray you to serve God and keep you out of brawls and brabbles and quarrels and dissensions, and I warrant you it is better for you. I will none of your money. It is a good shilling, I warrant you, or I will change it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Harold, are the dead numbered? Here is the number of the slaughtered French. What prisoners of good sort are taken, Uncle? Charles, Duke of Orleans, nephew to the King, Jan, Duke of Bourbon, and Lord Boussicot, of other lords and barons, knights and squires, full fifteen hundred, besides common men. This note of tell me of ten thousand French that in the field lie slain. Ten thousand. Of princes in this number and nobles bearing banners, there lie dead one hundred twenty-six. Added to these of knights, esquires, and gallant gentlemen, eight thousand and four hundred, of the which five hundred were but yesterday dubbed knights. So that in these ten thousand they have lost, there are but sixteen hundred mercenaries. The rest are princes, barons, lords, knights, squires, and gentlemen of blood and quality. Here was a royal fellowship of death. Where is the number of our English dead? Well, Edward, the Duke of York. The Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, Davy Gam, Esquire. None else of name, and of all other men, but five and twenty. O oh God, thy arm was here. And not to us, but to thy arm alone, ascribe we all. Take it, God, for it is none but thine. It is wonderful. Wonderful indeed. Come, go we in procession through the village, and be it death proclaimed through our host to boast of this or take that praise from God, which is his only. Is it not lawful, I please your majesty, to tell how many is killed? Yes, Flewellen, but with this acknowledgement that God fought for us. Yes, my conscience, he did us great good. Do we all holy rites, let there be sung non nobis and te deum, the dead with charity enclosed in clay. And then to Calais, and to England then, when ne'er from France arrived more happier men. That was Henry at Agincourt, devised from Shakespeare's Henry V. Richard Burton played Henry V and John Neville played the chorus with Martin Lewis, Richard Bebb, John Gabriel, George Merritt, Dudley Jones, Manning Wilson, Geoffrey Matthews, Hamilton Dice, Richard Williams, Olaf Poulet and Peter Howell. It was produced by John Gibson and that was first aired in 1956.